Good morning and welcome to Madison Church of Christ. I'm so glad we get to be here and worship together uh, with the lights on, uh, considering the events of last night. That's a blessing uh, because they were out here for a while. Uh, there are some announcements in your bulletin that I want to bring your attention to, uh, some that aren't. Well, let's, let's talk about the Bible quiz first here. We've had uh, two weeks in a row of the North leading in responses. So way to go, Northside. After taking six straight L's, we are, we are making a comeback, and uh, I'm just really encouraged uh, by you guys uh, submitting the quiz. So this is just a fun way that we can uh, add an element of competition to our Bible reading plan for this year. The most important thing I want you to know is that we're reading our Bibles together in 2022. We're reading through the New Testament and Psalms, and we have a reading plan that goes through about eight chapters each week. You can find the details on our website, or you can find reading plan sheets in the foyer, uh, or you can find uh, each week's, the reading for each week listed on the back of your bulletin when you come here. And we would love for you to read the Bible together with us. Uh, you will find that it is an incredible blessing to your life when you start reading the Bible regularly. So that's what's going on with the quiz and the Bible reading plan. Uh, we, uh, let's see, we're starting L Lent season. That means soup suppers in Brooklyn. And we have soup suppers and ladies' breakfast to support the Brooklyn Ministerial Alliance. So the the first uh, ladies' breakfast is this Tuesday at 9 a.m. at the United Methodist Church in town in Brooklyn. And then the soup supper is at the Methodist Church Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And so if you'd like to be a part of those, uh, we'll be participating with that. I just want to give you a heads up that uh, CIBC is uh, gearing up to get ready for the camp season. And there are some dates on the calendar to be aware of for that. Their, their auction, which is their biggest fundraiser every year, is on August 23rd. Uh, if you have any items you want to donate to CIBC's auction, uh, we can... What's that? No. Not August. No. I'm sorry. April 23rd. The other month that starts with an A. Yes. <laughs> April 23rd. Uh, I apologize. April 23rd. Uh, if you have anything you want to donate to the auction, uh, let me know. We can try to get it out there for you. Uh, we'll have crews going out on work days, and there are three work days on the schedule this year. April 9th, uh, May 7th, and May 14th. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of those. And then finally, today after church, we want you to eat lunch with us. Uh, we have some spaghetti cooking downstairs, and uh, we would like to serve you lunch. Um, we will, uh, you, we'll, it's an opportunity for us to tell you about our Mexico trip and to raise money for our Mexico trip. And so if you want to make a donation to our Mexico trip, when you go down to eat, there'll be a basket there for that. After lunch, uh, there'll be a short presentation. I literally, I'm going to bring a timer with me and set it at 15 minutes, okay? When it goes off, I'm done talking, and I'll tell you about our trip to Mexico, and then we'll have a dessert auction where you uh, have the opportunity to purchase some excellent Madison Church desserts to take home with you to raise money for our trip to Mexico. We would love for you to join us for lunch. There's plenty of food downstairs. Even if you don't want to stick around for the dessert auction or you can only, only be there for a minute, just come get some food, and we would love to feed you. And uh, with that, we're going to go to a time of prayer. I'd like to read from Isaiah 34. Draw near, O nations, to hear, and give attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all their hosts. He has devoted them to destruction. He has given them over for slaughter. Their slain shall be cast out and the stench of their corpses shall rise. The mountains shall flow with their blood. All the hosts of heaven shall ride away and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall as leaves fall from the vine like leaves falling from the fig tree. I hope the news this week hasn't given you tunnel vision. The latest sign of virtue is to jump on the Ukraine train and cancel anything Russian. The media in the West have clearly painted one side good and the other evil. In America's attempt to take the moral high ground, our nation does not recognize that it cannot do so. We talk about a tyrant on a power grab who wants more power and control and has killed innocent civilians. Here we murder babies, the most innocent among us. In fact, on Monday, there was a vote for the Women's Health Protection Act. 
where 46 U.S. senators voted for on-demand abortion up to the point of birth. Because of our denial and rejection of God, as Paul says in Romans 1, God's wrath is being poured out. It's already here. Our culture has been given over to impurity, to homosexuality, and now to a debased mind. The mind is so corrupted, we call evil good and good evil. We think a man can be a woman and a woman a man. We give kids hormones to try and transition and think there won't be consequences. And we call it progress. We have denominations splitting, as the Methodist Church is doing right now. Because some can't take God's word as it is, even when it's plain as day. And unfortunately, some denominations are just too far gone. There's much more I could say, but as we pray today, remember this. The Lord is enraged against all nations. The only hope is, as David said in Psalm 2, kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Would you pray with me? Father God, you are almighty. And every nation has gone its own way. Lord, who can stand before you unless we take refuge in your Son? God, that is our prayer this morning for those who need repentance, that they would repent and turn to your Son because that is the only hope. God, we lift up those on our prayer list this morning. And I just ask for your will to be done. I ask that you be with us now as we worship you together. That we, you would focus our hearts and our minds on you. And you would, that you would be pleased um, with the worship of you. May you be honored and glorified. Just work on our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we sing today?
moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Let's sing that again. And you are here, moving in Tasted and 
blessing of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord and Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. And there's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your living home, your presence, Lord. As I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. In Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence. Lord, in your presence, Lord, let us become more aware of your presence, let us experience the glory of your goodness, let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness and Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what I Oh, 
Sunday school, the last few months we've been going through the Gospel of John. I have read through it numerous times, but never had really studied it. I have learned so much in preparation for class, but also in the discussions we've had. The book follows the three years of Jesus' ministry, which ultimately leads to the cross and then to his resurrection. So far, we've read about the calling of the disciples his authoritative way of teaching, and the miracles he did. He used his power to heal the sick and the disabled, drawing in crowds so he could share the true meaning of the scripture and the prophecy. Often the truths he was telling came in conflict with the leaders and authorities at the time. The people were drawn to him in the words he spoke. There was no one like him at the time, not before, not since. He told them very clearly who he was and why he was here, but the people and the leaders didn't understand or chose not to. In chapter 5, he talks about life through the sun and upset the leaders of the day. I'm reading from chapter 5, verses 15, or 16 through 25. <clears throat> so Jesus, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work. So to this very day, I, too, am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing, because whatever the father does, the son does also. <clears throat> For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show you him even greater things than these. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, the time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Did you catch that? Those who hear my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. They have crossed from death to life. He goes on to say a time is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Who is he talking to? Who are the dead? All of them and us are the dead in that we all are dead in our sin. 
Most people then and now don't want to admit that, but it is true. Without his death on the cross to pay our debt, our sins would, for our sins, we would be lost for eternity. And as prepared to take the communion today, remember the price that was paid for us. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come and worship you. We thank you so much for the blessings you've given us, the greatest of all, which was sending your son to die in our place so that we might spend eternity with you. <clears throat> As we prepare to take communion today, let us reflect on our sins that we've committed and ask your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we gather here today to hear your message, to give you thanks for the many blessings. The words in the Bible are God's words. God has promised us if we are obedient to these words, he will give us many more blessings. So take this offering, use it in your kingdom, in your church, 
and in your name. We are drawing near to the end of a series about what scripture is and how we should use it. And the last two times that we've met to discuss this topic, we have completed an exercise where we look at one text from the Bible. Uh, we started with Matthew 19 and we did Psalm 25 last week. And, and we discuss how those words that we find on the page in our Bible can become meaningful information for our lives. And we've done so to answer the question, how do I find meaning in the Bible? And we've been looking at the Bible uh, the best way, okay? Uh, this is the way that we are, the best way to draw meaning and information from the Bible is, is to start out with a text and, and read it and, and take in the information uh, that you find there without any preconditions or, or any ambitions, just looking at it for itself, its own qualities. This is the best way to read the Bible. That's why your daily Bible reading is so important. The, the idea that you would come to Scripture with, without any other intention other than just to know what it is and what it says is uh, crucially important. But sometimes and oftentimes, it's not practical. Many times, our quest for meaning in the Bible doesn't begin with the text, but it begins with the life situation or a question or a decision that we need help through or guidance for. The Bible is useful for this. It's not, an, it's not invalid to go to the Bible or use it this way, uh, but this morning we will talk about how. How do we start in a situation where we have a question or a decision to make, and then how do we use the Bible uh, faithfully to answer that question? And so we'll talk about how to do that, and we'll, we'll use another exercise to demonstrate using our Bibles in this manner. But before we continue, let me just reemphasize a point I made earlier, that this manner, the one you see there on the bottom, of finding meaning in the Bible has to be secondary. If you get used to only approaching the Bible as an answer to questions or decisions that you're facing, then you are going to be very bad at using your Bible. You need to get used to interacting with the Bible in a way where you can read and accept what it is saying uh, without approaching it with, uh, with your own terms, coming, coming to the text, with, without approaching it with your own ambitions about what, it, what the text needs to be doing for you. Unless your mind and your heart are taking in God's word for its own sake regularly, your attempts to use the Bible situationally is likely to end in error. But if you treasure and know God's word, then in every situation, every question, every decision that you approach in life will be guided by the hand of God. Do you understand what I said? If you treasure and know God's word, Every situation, every question, every decision that you approach in life will be guided by God's hand. How could the Bible do something like that? You know as well as I do that there are a ton of questions in, that the Bible doesn't discuss. You've run, a lot of, through, you've run across a lot of situations in your life where there's no direct answer in the Bible to what you're facing. Questions like, uh, should I buy a used car or a new one? Is there a verse for that? No. Should I live in Brooklyn, Iowa or Brooklyn, New York? There's no verse for that. Should I rent more ground or say no thanks? Should we take grandma to the nursing home? Should I add this new medicine? Those are questions that there just aren't answers for in the Bible. I can't give you a, a book name and, and chapter and verse for, for how to answer that question or make that decision. How could God's word help me answer questions like this when there's no Bible verse that answers any of them? First, let me remind you of what we have read in 2 Timothy chapter 3. There we read this. 
Paul speaking to Timothy, he says, And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want you to pay close attention to what it says at the end of that passage, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Even though the Bible doesn't answer every question you have, and even though there's not one Bible verse for every situation that you're going to come across in life, the Bible equips us thoroughly, thoroughly for every good work. Meaning that in every situation in our lives, God's word gives us what we need to know to make the right decision, to give the correct answer, and to pick the best path forward. Before we discuss how to use the Bible to do that, let me issue two warnings. Okay? First, in your life of faith, when you need direction or answers, find it in God's word and not in signs. Unfortunately, we live in an era in, in Christianity, in evangelical Christianity, our, in our modern time is full of Christians seeking signs from God and telling others that they should do so when they face decisions or tough situations. When you have a tough decision to make, they might ask you to, to pray and ask God to, to show you through some miraculous means what it is that, that you should do. This is a misguided approach to understanding will. It's misguided because nowhere in Scripture are we directed to understand God's will in this way. In fact, most often in Scripture, when we see people doing this, people uh, like Gideon asking God for a sign, it is, it is treated as, as something that, that is not good, that is at the very least unnecessary, and at the very worst can, can be very misguided. We're never directed to ask God for a sign, for some miraculous uh, manifestation of his will that is in addition to the words of the Bible. That's not what, just simply not what we're told to do in Scripture. There's an acute version of seeking signs that you may have, you may have heard before. I, I can tell you I, I've, uh, there's been a person in my life who was facing a decision about where they wanted to move and pursue their career. And... Uh, they, so they prayed about it, and then they believed that when God showed them a license plate on a car in front of them from the state of Florida, that God was telling them that that is where they should go. Okay? That, that's the kind of sign-seeking that I'm talking about. That's, it's, it's incidental, and I'm not saying God can't bless their life in Florida. I believe he, he did, and he, he will. But that's not how we find God's will. God doesn't tell us anywhere in his word that he's going to reveal his will, will to us through license plates or for, through other miraculous circumstances like that. You may also hear somebody say, uh, pray to God and say, if, God, if you want me to do such and such, then you know, make something happen. Make it rain next Tuesday. Okay? Asking for a sign. This is exactly what Gideon did. Uh, or, or you may hear somebody say, God, if you don't want me to do this, then stop me. Right? But all of these are, are attempts to get additional information from God, essentially saying that the information that God has given us in his word, right, the commission that we have in his word to live our lives in a certain way as disciples of Jesus isn't enough information for us, and we require some additional amount of revelation from God, and we're, we're asking him to provide that for us miraculously. I think that's a misguided way to understand what God wants for your life. There's also... Uh, a, a more dull version of seeking signs that was popularized in the, became very popular in the late 90s and early 2000s in a book called Experiencing God uh, that was circulated around our churches um, th that says, in order to find God's will, you need to see where God is working and then join him, right? And so their, their theory or thesis was that you can, in your life, see where God is working, see where things are being successful and blessed, and you can join God. You have to be willing to join God in that. But it has a faulty premise. The faulty premise of that system or that, that way, manner of understanding what God's will is assumes 
that God's will is always related to the thing that is going great or being blessed. When the truth of the gospel is, from Jesus Christ, is that oftentimes if you are doing God's will, you will be persecuted and downtrodden and that you won't have an easy time because, because the world is an opposition to the gospel and an opposition to Jesus. And, that if, and so if you spend your life looking for God's will in this way, seeing what's being successful or, or seeing where you think God's moving by, by giving his blessing to, to certain, um, certain things in your life and chasing after those, then your God is not God himself. It is blessing and success. Look for to God's word for, for making your important decisions, for, for determining the path of your life, and don't look to signs. Uh, they, can be, they can be misleading and nowhere in Scripture where we're directed to look for them. The second warning I'll offer is this, is when you're looking to God's word for answers, don't make the Bible what it is not. Okay? It's important to know that the Bible is not an answer book for you. It wasn't written as an index of, of answers for your life. And when we treat the Bible as an answer book or, or do, take something like proof texting, we pull words out of the, their context in the Bible, we, we take them out of their context so we, we misuse the way that they're written in God's word and make them mean something that they were never supposed to. Uh, let me give you an example. When facing the decision of whether to have soup or sandwiches for supper tonight, Fred may be reminded of words from 2 Kings 4, verse 40, where it says, O man of God, there is death in the pot. And he would decide to have sandwiches. Okay. Or when Fred goes to college and is offered some recreational drugs, he may be reminded of these words from 2 Kings 4, 40, O man of God, there is death in the pot. And he would decide to abstain. See, this verse is a two for one. Now, there's nothing wrong with sandwiches, and I really am glad that Fred passed on the marijuana. But he did not use God's word faithfully to make those decisions. He took a line from a story about the prophet Elisha uh, in 2 Kings chapter 4 is highlighting the miraculous power of God's prophet and contrasting his power and his success to the, to the misery and, uh, and just failure of God's people, Israel, because of their unfaithfulness in Elisha's time. And Fred ripped those words out of context to make a completely arbitrary, arbitrary decision that has nothing to do with God's word. Now you might hear this and think that Fred sounds ridiculous, but if you've ever encouraged yourself with the, these words from the prophet Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future, without considering the plight of Judah in exile in Babylon, or the role that their faithfulness played in their restoration from their exile, you're doing the same thing. You have to understand the Bible as God's story first. You have to understand what God is communicating to us through these verses before you can use them to make the right decisions. And if all you treat them is words that you can pull out to, to make arbitrary decisions, like super sandwiches for supper, then, uh, then you're really mistreating God's word. And this is why reading it regularly is so important. Because if all you do is go to the Bible for answers, then that, that's the only way you'll ever know how to treat it. But if you read God's word every day, or if you have a certain number of chapters that you're committed to reading every week, and all you're doing is going to the text saying, you know, teach me, Lord, without any ambitions about what, this, what these words have to do for you, then you can start to understand the story of the Bible and the story of redemption that you find there. Secondly, and this is crucially important to not making the Bible what it is not, you have to understand that the Bible does not contain specific information just for you. Your emotional responses to certain words of Scripture are wonderful, but they're not instructive. Uh, the Bible doesn't mean one thing to one person and another thing to somebody else. 
God's word was given to all of his people. And there's no biblical justification for reading God's word and finding a passage that sticks out and holding it above another. All of God's word should stick out to you. It is given to all of God's people. The Bible does not contain specific information just for you. So now let's take a life example of a decision that the Bible does not directly address and examine how God's word can guide us to make the right decision. I thought uh, hard about what, what decision we could talk about on peaceable terms. <laughs> well, wh- what, can we, what can we discuss here? So let's just think about this for a second. Think about the decision that you have to make in life sometime about should I change jobs? Maybe you've faced that decision before. Uh, uh, there was a time in my life where I faced that decision like every year <laughs> in uh, college and seminary, and, and um, I was wondering, like, should I change jobs or do a different kind of work? And as we start out on making this decision, I just want to point out that there are many kinds of work that don't receive a W-2 or a 1099. And so uh, a job here doesn't necessarily mean the kind you're on payroll for. It can, but it can also mean your, uh, the work that you fill your life with during the day, the, the goal that you have or the, the role that you have maybe in your family or uh, in a group. And, um, or it may also, we can use this just to talk about our profession or career. The truth is that the Bible has a whole lot of things to say about our work. And to look at them all can be a little dizzying. Let's run through some just for fun, okay? The Bible says you should work. 2 Thessalonians 3 says, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. See, the other passages there listed under that bullet point are from the beginning uh, of God's revelation. Uh, God telling uh, Adam and Eve to, uh, uh, or God telling the Israelites to work for six days and then rest on the seventh. Uh, God, God telling uh, Adam and Eve to fill the earth and subdue it. Additionally, uh, the Bible says you should work to provide for your family. 1 Timothy 5 says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We learn from the Bible that, that you may have individual traits or gifts that make some kinds of work more suitable to you than other kinds. The passage there from Exodus is, is God telling the Israelites that he has gifted certain people in their community who were skilled for the construction of the tabernacle and the kind of furnishings that, that they were putting in there that had to make. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, it says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There's more that the Bible says about work. The list goes on here. Is, uh, the Bible tells us you should work hard no matter the circumstance. So even if you're in a, a bad job or one you don't like or your boss isn't a very good person, you should still work hard. To, to those in slavery in the city of Colossae, the, God's word says this, Colossians 3, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. God's word, well, I went ahead here. God's word says to do everything for God's glory. That's important when we consider what to do for our work. 1 Corinthians 10 says, so what, wh- whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We also learn in God's word that your work and wealth and possessions and time should be used to serve others. That's what Jesus was speaking of in Matthew chapter 6 when he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I could keep going on like this for quite some time. There is a list of principles that, that would be in the hundreds long uh, that you, truth that you can observe from Scripture that would relate to the decision that you make about whether or not to change jobs. 
if you are regularly reading your Bible, then these passages will be available to your mind and your heart so that you are equipped to value the right things, the truths of the Bible, as you're making your decisions. If you're seeking the advice of a friend on a big decision like this, or, or you are a friend giving, an advi giving advice to someone about a decision like this, these would be great things to bring up. Remind them of what God says about work. Remind them of, them of what God says about the purpose of wealth and treasure. Be willing to point out to someone if someone is overlooking an important biblical truth about their decision when you counsel them as a friend. But ultimately, lists of verses like this are not going to be the most helpful in you making the decision whether or not you should change jobs. Really, answering the question this way would be dizzying, right? There are a couple hundred verses we could list that, that apply in some way to the kind of work you do, what you spend your life doing as a profession. It would be dizzying to try to compile them all and, and chart between them which one favors one job you're considering over the other. Lists of verses like this are the background to a beautiful portrait. They're like an orchestra behind a vocalist. Lists of verses like this, uh, you could think of them as the soil from which arises a flower. Ultimately, what you need to know is that God does not call you to a certain job, but to a whole life. And the most important thing you can do with God's word related to this decision is to know the direction and purpose of your life. Looking at the minutiae, each individual verse and each individual principle about work in the Bible uh, is helpful only after you understand the story of redemption told through the whole Bible and you know your place in it so that you can know who you are as God's child, as a disciple of Jesus, and what you are to do. The truth is, the truth revealed in Scripture is that you are a creation of God. You're loved and known by Him. You have sinned, and your sins harm you. They separate you from God. They degrade you away from what you were made to be. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins so that your burden and penalty could be lifted from your shoulders. Jesus triumphed over death and inaugurated the kingdom of God on earth to which you belong as Jesus' disciple and, and you have a mission and a purpose in his kingdom that is the truest and most worthy purpose of your life. This is the testimony of scripture about who you are and what you are here for. And when you read God's word, this narrative and this truth about redemption and your identity and purpose are the largest story. And you really need to see it, right? You need, you need to understand where you fit in this large story that stretches clear from Genesis to Revelation about redemption and God and human beings. That arc covers every page of the Bible from beginning to end, and you need to know the story. And one of the joys, one of the wonderful things about reading the Bible is hearing that story told to you over and over and over so you don't forget about how dark sin is and our world without the hope of salvation is. And you know the glory of God's grace which arrived through Jesus Christ, and you know what you have been given through what he did for you on the cross and over the grave, and you know who you are as his disciple, as a member of his church, his body in the world that is about the work of continuing his ministry and, and embodying his kingdom until the day he arrives and brings justice. Truly, the decision to change jobs comes down to this simple delineation. Will changing jobs make me a better disciple of Jesus? then once you can address that question, then you can use what you know of Scripture, the list of verses I put up on the screen, to determine whether the answer is yes or no. But you need to start with this question to use the Bible correctly. 
You need to know that your purpose as a human being in God's kingdom is to be one of Jesus' disciples and to be about the work of his kingdom filled with his spirit. And that is true of every decision you face. Not just big ones like where to live or who to marry or when to retire, but even the small ones like how to spend your afternoon or what to eat for supper or what show you watch tomorrow evening. They all need to be put in the context of this large narrative of redemption in Scripture. And when you put it in that context, you can use Scripture to ask, will this decision, will this direction or change make me a better disciple of Jesus? And when you know that it will, you must obey. God's Word helps you make the decision because it shows you that big story about who you are, what Jesus has done for you, and your place in God's kingdom. And then when you know that, when you're aware of of what what your purpose as as a person is, then you can use what you find in God's word to help inform your decision about how to do that the best way. I want to show you a passage from James chapter 4. It's one of my favorite. In verse 13 we read, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll do this, We'll go to this city or we'll spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Then these words. If anyone then knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. God's word helps you make decisions by showing you who you are and giving you the information you need to know about what the right thing to do is. And you will probably not hear a voice from the sky. You probably won't get to read a message from God in your alphabet soup. But you have God's word. And if you're filling your heart and your mind with God's word, you will know, you will be able to decide what will help you be a better disciple of Jesus. Then you'll be able to make the decision. That's how God helps you. That's how God's word gives you the information you need to know to make the right decision. Please pray with me. Dearly Father, guide us in the truth. Fill our minds and our hearts with your word so that when we face decisions in life, we will have clarity about how it is that we can best follow you. Dear God, give us the wisdom to see our place in your story. To know at the core of our being, our place as your child and your disciple and your servant. Dear Holy Father, let that truth soak in all through our life. Through the decisions we make each day and the, especially the big decisions we make about what to do with our life. Things like where to work and live and who to love. You've got to reveal your will to us through your word so that we can be faithful. I thank you for this time that we get to spend together here today. I pray that you will bless the food that we go downstairs and eat here in a minute. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Do you stand as we close today?
Sunday. We'll see you next week.